Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for July 24th, 2013. I'm Matt Grabal from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com or on Twitter at Uppercut Wood. If you're watching the video but you want to participate in the chat, head over to uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom and sign up with Twitter and you can jump into the conversation tonight. As always tonight with me is the crazy Canadian, Chris Wong. Say hey, Chris. Hi. Yes, that's me, uh, Chris Wong here from Flair Woodworks. You can find me on Twitter at Flair Woodworks and follow my web follow my blog and check out my website at flairwoodworks.com. Now, our special guest tonight is the next number seven. Uh, that's a 007 of the telephone game design experiment, and that's Diami Plotki. How are you doing, Diami? I'm doing well, guys. Thank you for having me on. Where can we find your blog, and where can we follow you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me on the web at penultimatewoodshop.com, and on the Twitters, I am at Diami Plotke. That's D-Y-A-M-I-P-L-O-T-K-E. There we go. Okay, so as I mentioned, Diami is the seventh person to redraw the telephone game design. And I'm being careful not to call it a table because it may not be a table one day. I don't want to imply that it has it to stay be at the table. It might be a kitty cat pretty soon. It might be. So this is Diami. Do I talk about a bit about the design before I show it, Diami? Um, sure, sure. I Like I told you guys earlier, um, I tried to take what I think of as the telephone game and really only look at the last copy. So I really only looked at Megan's copy, right? She was number six? That's right. Um, so I took her... Her, her drawing, and I really liked the recessed section in the middle. I, I view it as a desk based on the way the way Megan's drawn it. Um, so let's say it's morphed into a desk at this point. It'll probably morph into, what was it, a dog, a cat, by the time we're done? Mm -hmm. um, but as for the, let's, say, let's call it a desk, as you can envision it, the center writing section is somewhat recessed from the main surface of the top. And I really liked that it was almost like a, a cloud lift in reverse kind of shape where it dipped down. And I really liked that subtle curve where it dropped. Um, so I incorporated that and then started working my way around the outside of the desk to, to tweak the outside edge to something I liked a bit more because the outside was very, very pointy and angular. And I didn't think that quite worked with the, the flow of the inside. Um, so I rounded out the outside and I tried to bring that into the curve of the legs. And I kept the same curve of the legs that it had. Um, and I kept the stretchers between the bottom legs, which incorporated a nice cloud lift before I worked on it at all. I kept that cloud lift in. And then I don't know what you'd call the members that run vertically from the stretchers up to the top, but I took them out because I thought they were just a bit distracting. So I tried to pare it down just a little bit and take that the curve of the recessed section was kind of my inspiration, and I tried to bring that to the outside edge of the desk and flow that right into the legs. I think you did a great job of that, Diami. Oh, well, well, thank you. Do you have pictures? I can yes. share them, or do you I want to put them up? up? Yeah, I'll share them so you can okay. continue to talk and you can see your lovely face there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'll have a link for you guys in a second here. Okay. But I'm screen sharing the image here. So you've got a front a front view and a back view. Yes. What tool did you use? Was these, are these hand sketches? Here. These are hand sketches. What I did was the really... God bless you for using hand sketches. The really fancy version of... Oh, I'm dropping my papers here. Um, the really fancy version of taking the printout of the prior design and laying tracing paper over it and changing the tracing version to come up with my design. So my design is simply two sketches on a piece of tracing paper. Cool. Uh, I had originally planned to make an actual 3D model and my attempt to shape 60 PSI extruded polystyrene was an absolute bloody miserable failure. So I went back to pen and paper. Uh -huh. I like how you steered away from CAD, and you tried. I like. I was really excited to see a, a three-dimensional, full 
a full scale, I guess, too, right? Model. Um, I, I would say it's full scale. Honestly, I don't know what the scale of this thing should be, but I was making it mm. the size that I, I felt it should be. So, yeah, let's say it was full scale. I never actually, like, opened um, SketchUp and took their dimensions Did off of it. So like that, yeah. I don't know if this was really full scale or not, but at least for my vision, it was. Well, I would say full scale, or an, an actual uh, three-dimensional mock-up, not, not just an, an image on a computer. And, well, it didn't quite happen, but um, I think we'll get there someday, and I think we've got Vic working on some 3D <laughs> printed. Uh, no, I don't think so, but that, that's a dream we have, to, mm -hmm. get, them all, to get each design uh, printed on a 3D printer. Oh, that so would be cool. really cool. Can, uh, can Fong help you with that? Tool Tutor? Uh, we're, still, we're still working on that part. Um, maybe. Um, nonetheless, I'm really happy that you, you got away from CAD, and even with your final drawings here, they're actually done in pen and paper. So That's just a reminder, you don't need to be using CAD to participate in this game. Mm -hmm. And don't feel what bad I, about your sketching skills. That doesn't mean you don't. That doesn't yeah. mean you can't participate. You don't need to be able to do photorealistic hand shaded drawings. Yeah. Yeah, and you can always cheat like I did and just take out the tracing paper. It works. Yeah. So let's see that model. Oh, well, let me pull back. Here is what was going to be the top. And the corners, the outside edge, this convex curve, came out nicely. I was able to use a really uh, crappy rasp I have and, and shape it very nicely. And then a little 100 grit paper made it smooth. Um, but then the center section was where it all came apart. And if you look at the video, you can, well, I guess if they hear me, they're looking at the video. Uh, if you see how it's really recessed back here, and it's just, it just turned to crap. And then... I was going to kind of accept that the center part wasn't the way I wanted it to be, but then what happened was I was setting the first leg in. I talked with Andy Chidwick about this because he does a lot of foam mock-ups, so I was asking him how he joins it, and he said he just does normal joinery usually. So I made a tenon. You can see the tenon here, and as I was flaring the leg into the bottom, the whole leg snapped off, and that's when I said, screw this, and I went inside and took out the pen of paper. Gotcha. Okay. So... This was an exercise in design frustration because I'll be honest. This, though, I just did it with the tracing paper. I yeah. don't usually take a design this far in terms of sketching. I usually get just enough on paper that I've decided on what I'm going to do, and then I just take it to the wood and I work out the final details right in the piece. Yeah. Uh, so this was a little different for me trying to come up with a finalized design in the design phase rather than the build phase. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Brian Van Reedy asked an interesting question. He goes, what techniques would you use to build this? So, if you were going to build the real thing, what would you do? Um, if I was going to build the real thing, I would glue up the top probably like a normal laminated top. Um, the legs to the top, frankly, I would do it with a domino. Uh, you, a normal mortise and tenon would work just fine. I'm lazy. I like the domino. <laughs> so, that's what I would do personally. And I, that's how I would join the stretchers also. And what I would do is probably kind of rough cut them on the bandsaw, and then once I got it glued up, I would just attack it with um, with rasps and just do a bit of probably a little bit of power shaping, but mostly hand shaping, and just smooth them all into each other and try to get it as organic as I could. Um, and then as for the top, for that recess in the top, I would mill out the bulk of that waste just with a router, and then. Um, probably step the router. And I think the hardest part in the real piece, just like it was in the model, is getting those flares on the side of the recess in the top. Um, right. And I'm not entire. The, I'd probably end up cheating up to that, maybe with a chisel and, and a, uh, a curved card scraper to kind of get the final shape. I'm not entirely sure how I would get that final shape in the real piece. You're talking about the ramps that go from the lower section to the higher, right? Yes, yeah, the ramps, which in my design are on three sides of the lower section. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As, as it was with the original, I think everyone since then as well. Is it? Okay. Yeah, that, that is a tough one. Um, I don't know, Matt, have we had a good solution for that yet? To, to shape it? No, we have talked about... Um... A, a lamination would do it if you lamination cut it out on the bandsaw. With, with a with a vacuum bag, I think is what we talked about. Mm. Building 
building forms and all that. Um, that, that. I think that would definitely work, but I was just trying to think. Of, I don't have a vacuum bag, and I don't think I would bother <clears throat> laminating it. I think I would probably... The more I think about it, I think I would route it and use a series of different router bits and kind of creep up on the shape as best I could. And then I think I would just probably do it by eye with a with a curved... Uh, cur with a... Of card scraper. You were just in the submarine there for a second, but yes, a card scraper. Yep. You might be able to attack it with a spoke shave a little bit. Um, mm. Yeah, it'd be it'd be it'd be it'd be interesting. Um, one of the other ways, Chris, was to do it in slices. Remember, so make a template of the edge and cut cut out a bunch and do it butcher block style, where you did a bunch of a bunch yeah. of slices. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you could shape the individual slices and glue them up when you got all the shapes right. But um, mm -hmm. um, you guys have seen those. Um, I think they're like Queen Anne, like uh, one of those tables with the tray top, where it's a yep. single piece. The whole thing is carved on the inside. Yep. Would it be any different from that? Like a tea table, a Queen Anne tea table. Yeah, it's really not much different than that, is it? But that molding is usually applied. Yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, Aesthetically, Not always, it's kind though, of similar, I, I, but... Yeah, I, I believe... I remember reading a fine woodworking, woodworking article where, the, where it wasn't applied. Well, I, I tell you, what, what I could do, actually, is very easily create a very square recess and make a molding right. that has that, that swoopy shape to it and just apply that, sure. have it a little proud, and then smooth it on the top so it all blends in. Right. The, that might screw up the grain if I was going for a nice grain pattern. But. Yeah, that, that's the trouble. Um, I think I would route out that that bottom um, that bottom flat section and get that nice and flat, and then I'd lay out my ramps carefully and carve to those lines. I think that's mm -hmm. how I tackle it, and then sand it or scrape it until I had it uh, even. But it's a it's quite a technical challenge, though. Yeah, certainly. It's I think it's easily the easiest easily. The hardest part of, of any of the designs uh, that I've seen on this this table or desk or whatever we're going to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, design is a safe safe word to use. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to argue that design the design is, is the hardest word? part of the design. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you mentioned. You were shaping the legs or something, and they snapped off. Yeah, I was. I enjoyed shaping them. I think if the uh, the foam leg, like, the sort of polystyrene leg, and as I was as I was shaping it, I, I caught it with uh, with my the little rotary tool that I'm blanking the name of, and uh, it just it grabbed the leg the wrong way and just went flying across the shop. It snapped right where I right right at the shoulder of the tendon is where it snapped. Yeah. So. That was enough because what I was trying. Do you think you probably... have that problem on the real wood version? Um, no, I don't. Okay. I, I think the real wood would be quite a bit stronger than the foam. But you'd probably use um, dominoes for that. I would. I would probably domino it, and I would probably shape it the same way between the power carver and and the rasp. Uh, but on this, I couldn't. Even, I was using the power carver because it, with the high RPMs, it actually grabbed the foam less than yeah. the rasp did. The rasp was, was getting a lot more bite and really rocking things along. So I don't know if you can see on the webcam, but that little recess there was where I was starting to flare the leg into it. And like I said, yeah. it just it took it and took it right off. Yeah. And what I would have to do, I realized, is leave maybe glue on some blocks on the bottom to fit around the leg that I could then incorporate them into the curve because if I just put the leg right on the bottom and then tried to flare it in I'd end up recessing the bottom so I'd, I'd have to build it up around the leg a little bit to give me a space to make that flared joint between the leg and the table that's quite the bit of sculpting there I never would have guessed from the start that we would have kept um, the sculpted furniture theme this long, I thought that we'd <laughs> be back to something a bit more ordinary, which is awesome, I love it. There's a lot of rounding and sculpting in your design, and it's going to be a lot of handwork. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that yeah. it will, but I don't know, I got into, 
the first thing I did sculpting wise was I made a couple of wands a few years ago and I made them entirely by hand with a, I don't have a lathe so I roughed them out of the bandsaw and then did it all by hand with rasps and it was they were small projects so it wasn't a terrible amount of work but for what it was it was a lot of work but I just loved the yeah. the process of working with the rasp and shaping it and I've seen my own designs become they're not I wouldn't go so far as to call them sculptural yet but they're becoming more and more sculptural that's cool yeah, I've, I've definitely noticed that. Um, in uh, fact... They can... Go ahead, Diami. No, I was going to say, the design I've got kicking around in my head now for a chair, it's not your typical sculpted chair, and it's going to incorporate some very square components in the arms and legs, but the seat in the back I plan to sculpt. and It may be a complete failure, but my goal is to kind of juxtapose square with sculpted components and see how that works out. Interesting. Uh, I like. I look forward to seeing that design. Yes. So do I. I'm looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at this tabletop again, and that profile where it curves um, from the lower to the upper section looks like the profile of a thumbnail bit, um, except a lot larger. I wonder if you could get that kind of a bit on a shaper and run it with a giant template or something. You might be able to, and it also kind of looks like some of the curved um, raised panel bits. But again, I yeah, don't think you're going to drop like that a into it. Raised yeah. panel almost, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, that's interesting. You could make this um, almost as if you were making a giant raised panel door, and leave one of the rails off in the front. Uh, oh, okay, sure. Right. Yeah. You have the thing along the back, sorry, thing along the back, two on the side, and you have the panel in the middle that's sunken, right? You make a, you make, you make a sunken panel separately, and you put it into a raised panel. Right. Um, that's still going to be a lot of, you're still going to end up doing a lot of handwork that you can't avoid. Yeah. And you have, that, have to worry about getting that, that green transition, right? Yep. That's the hardest part of the whole piece, I would think, is to get the grain transition right. Mm -hmm. It's going to look weird if the grain transition's not right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll tell you, in terms of, of the handwork, the more I get into the sculpting, the, there is a lot of handwork, and you end up using the rasps a lot. But I've found that between cut sole blades um, and the aggressive little four-inch uh, Festool sander with a hard platen and a 32 oh, yeah. grit or 24 grit paper, I end up doing yeah. the bulk of my shaping with pow by power and then just kind of yeah. flaring it and evening it out by hand. Yeah, like that um, Arbor Tech or something almost. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I have an Arbor Tech bit that I've not used yet. I haven't had the chance to to shape with the the turbo plane yet, but I've used the cut sole blade quite a bit. I, I imagine that a lot of the challenges people have when they hollow out um, seats of chairs, mm -hmm. you'd have the, the very similar challenges making the top of this desk. Yeah. Hollowing that out, basically. Mm -hmm. But I think that might be, you know, to, to what I've seen guys do, like um, Canadian Woodworks, Paul Leminski, Leminski, what he does is he does his he doesn't rough them out on the bandsaw. He does he's not one of those guys who glues up the block who kind of rough shapes the blocks of the seat before he glues them up. He does all his shaping with this big square block okay. for the seat. But he yeah. pre drills in a bunch of spots and he drills to the right. depth he wants the carving to be and then he carves down to the drill. Mm -hmm. I think in this you could again just rat out the middle. I think yeah. that we all agree that's the easiest way to get the middle out, but for the edge yeah. Drill in a couple spots and then slowly, with with the power tools, work my way down yeah. to those drill marks. I think that's, that a could... that's a model maker technique as well. Is it? Yeah. So if you were going to build something up, like a hillside, you'd mm -hmm. put you'd put plugs right, and then you'd build it up to match that slope. Okay. Uh, the other thing way, I think sculptural sculpts sculptural reconstruction of faces from skulls and things like that. So, um, creepy trivia. There you go. <laughs> the the other way I think that you could do it um, would be to cut a whole bunch of um, rabbits of 
less and less depth from the inside to the outside. So you have steps that yep. mm -hmm. yep. emanate that ramp. And that would give you a very controlled, very um, precise layout for your, wrap, for your wraps. And it'd just be a bit of sanding or whatever to, to get that even and flat. I, I think, think that would definitely uh, work. I think that's yeah, why so we do it. It would go. It would go. It would step yeah. down, yeah. and then you would be not. Then you would knock off the high spots essentially. Yep, yeah, that's right. That's how I would do it. I think. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and that would be especially in the corner transitions. That would be um, a lot of handwork. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 The corners. Would... You'd be getting some scoops and stuff. You'd be getting into carving, carving tools. Yeah. Which would be fun, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Give you a reason <laughs> why. Brian, <laughs> that's yeah. that's Brian was just commenting that. For. Yeah, Brian was just commenting that handwork is very, very enjoyable, and I think it really has to be if you are getting into sculptural furniture, because there really isn't a, a good way to avoid a lot of the handwork unless you've got some very specialized machinery to do that for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the machinery helps, but even with the machinery, it just reduces the amount of handwork you're going to do, but it, it's never going to eliminate it. Yeah. Use machines for hogging, not final shaping. Mm. Um, Brian just asked for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link to the design. Um, that's not pasting right. So I guess we're having a hard time getting Justin into the hangout. He was going, going to come in and discuss uh, this 16-foot workbench. Um, any ideas, Matt, on how to get him in here? I've invited him a bunch of times. He's not. He's not seeing the invite. Mm -hmm. He's got. He the invite should be there. I saw that you sent him a direct link. Yeah, I've got him to the page, but there's no button for him to join. Really? Hmm. Surprised no, you didn't see. I don't. We we had this issue with some of our guests on the MWA podcast, and I, I never quite understood what it was because it might have been that he circled us after the hangout began, and the hangout is not smart enough to realize yeah. that he's okay to join in, even though it's letting me invite him. Mm hmm. Hmm. Can we make him an, an, an admin of WoodChat for today and see if he can get in that way? Are you crazy? I don't know if that... Yes. We've actually we resorted to... to you know. can do a phone call from the Hangout and bring people in that way. That sounds good. Do you want to try that, Matt? Um, I'll go see, but he'll, he didn't have to log in. Oh, he'd have to change pages. Let's see. What, let's. I'll see what we can do. You guys keep. You guys keep talking wood chat. I'll keep talking nerd, sure. nerd, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All so right. um, Brian Brian Van Vliet is the next one up for this uh, telephone game. Now, how do you find the challenge? Was it? Did you did you limit yourself to three changes, or did you just kind of make one big change? It's what I kind of see. Were we supposed to limit ourselves to three changes? I began I this know, challenge by not reading the rules. I'll put it that way. Excellent. Cool. Um, uh, that's kind of a soft rule that we have. Okay. No, what I, I... I found, again, I found the square corners of the last one kind of incongruous with the design. So mm -hmm. I just started by rounding out the outside corners of the table to match the inside and flaring that right into the legs. And the rest of it just kind of developed from that. I don't think I changed the legs themselves too much other than to flare them into the top and bring that flare right around the corner. Um, and then I was done with that. I looked at it and I said that those vertic extra vertical pieces I thought just made it a little too busy. And by the time they got flared in, I didn't like the way they looked. Otherwise, they were right, going to be right. square. So I just I took them out. So I guess that's really not that many changes. Structurally, from the bottom down, I only removed yeah. the vertical pieces, really. Um, yeah, but it just kind of all evolves from rounding off the corners, and then I just kind of took that around the outside. Mm -hmm. Just want to remind everybody that you can view the progression of the design at uh, flowwoodworks.com, and up at the top there is a link to the telephone game, and that'll take you to a page that looks like this here. 
and you can see the designs. And this is where Diami started here with Megan Fitzpatrick's design, this one here. And he turned it into something like this here. I like the stretcher too. You've got it, you've got it a little bit. Now on, on this second picture here, the front picture, it looks like the stretcher is a little bit higher at the back than at the sides. But from the, yes, it the does. back, you, it looks like it's on level. Did you? My intention was to make it higher. Okay. And that wasn't so much a, a deliberate design intention as my interpretation of the previous design was that it was higher. And I thought about that and I said, that's going to make the tendons easier. I'll just leave it that way. And that was my plan. I didn't really get into what how it would work. I think that aesthetically, if, the, if this broad stretcher across, let's call it the back, matches the stretchers on the sides, I think that probably looks better than having them at different heights. But then you've got the issue yeah. of having those those tenons that, that meet together. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so, what, <laughs> so when they're at different levels, the joinery doesn't intersect, doesn't conflict at all. But yeah. I, I agree that it does look a bit more harmonious, but I was, I was actually drawn to that, that um, aspect of this design, having it at different levels. I thought that was a neat little... Yeah. So, the way and the way the I guess the front view shows the bottom of the back stretcher is even with the top of the side stretchers and mm -hmm. that would give another spot for if I am going to go in and and tweak it all with rasps and flare together and, and work it by hand that's a nice transition where you could take one plane and kind of meld it right into the other plane and, and yep. use that as an interesting point for them to meet so that might that leaving it at that that way where the one is higher than the other um, might actually allow for a lot more design freedom when you're when you're figuring out the legs. Mm -hmm. Megan says we should use a score. <laughs> this is exactly <laughs> what I meant by chair makers, but um, oh boy, um, how long would it take with the score to hollow that that tabletop? I guess for the sides it wouldn't be. I don't know. It depends on how awesome you are. It, it would take my... longer than I have patience for. Yeah, it wouldn't be my first pick. Yeah. Um, actually, what I found from carving hand planes from a single block is that if you have a stop cut, like in, in the instance of a hand plane um, where you, you mortise the body, what I did is I first took my body and I drilled um, my holes through the mouth. And then chiseling into that, uh, into the mortise was actually quite easy, into those drilled holes, because you're, 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 you're chiseling with the grain into uh, openness. And if you were to route out that bottom writing section, let's call it, then you're chiseling into the open section, so it might not take that long at all. Yeah, it's true. And then on the yeah. along the back, you're going across the grain, so that should be quick as well. Um, just using a gouge. Mm. The challenge would be getting those even curves um, at the bottom of that bottom of that ramp and at the top, the bottom especially. Yeah, and then again, like we talked about, really especially at the inside corner of the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they were angular corners, it'd be a lot simpler. Now let's make them round. We'll get some scorps. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Another change I like. So I'm going to figure out. Now we're going to have to do a witch hat on sharpening scorps. <laughs> <laughs> Be a special scorp sharpening stones. Maybe we could have a have a we have a speed contest a router against a scorp. Hmm. Interesting. That could be interesting. Can I tell you, I, mean, I got a festival power scorp. <laughs> you know what the best part about that is is the dust collection. Yeah, that's what I heard. And it's another change that I like. Payment plan. They have such a convenient payment plan. See that five times fast. No. Uh, another change that I like is the curved arches at the top here. Thank you. And I guess that comes from shaping the legs right into the top. Exactly. That just kind of grew out of out of shaping the legs. And you'll see, in one perspective, it's more arched than the other perspective. Um, in practice, I think I would probably end up with the one that's slightly less arched, but on the sides. Okay. 
I think I think I would flare them a lot more on the sides than on the front of the back. Um, mm-hmm. Because then you're yeah. I agree. Um, when you say flare, you mean bring it bring it out further. Yes, I would. Overhang? I would. I would bring those curves. Yeah. I guess make them a bigger radius so they came to get much closer together on the top. I don't think it would be quite a, a true arch, but they would come much much closer together in the top and be much bigger radius curves than on the front or back faces. And then that those whole side face has this gentle convex curve to it that I think I would not do too much rounding over of the side each side of the of the legs, they wouldn't be like a razor point, but but a, just a subtly rounded over, ninety degree corner there, um, just to take the sharpness off of it. Yeah. Hmm. But now again, this kind of design, I think I would, it could all change when there's actual you know wood in the shop and you're you're starting to shape things. You say, yeah, that doesn't work, and you you shape it a different way. And I don't think I could be married to. I mean, you build sculptural stuff like this more often than I do, Chris. Am I right that you, yeah, I mean, at some you point it's going to evolve itself as you're shaping it and you make decisions on the fly? Can you repeat, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was going to say, you do sculptural work a bit more than I do at this point. Right, would you agree that to a large degree you get close with the design, but because you're shaping it by hand and by eye, the final shape is always going to be a little bit different than what you'd envisioned because the piece just kind of dictates what it ends up being? Um, I would, but I don't usually have a very good idea what I'm doing beforehand. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's hard to say. But I can, I can definitely understand that point, though. And I wouldn't disagree with it. Okay. I'm sorry, Shannon needs to be taught what speed is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shannon Rogers yeah. is saying people should use a, a travisher. And he says, yeah. no way a router beats a scorp or a travisher. And my comeback is that a router is heavier, so it's easier yeah, to beat. I knew a guy named Travis in high school, and he was pretty fast, but I don't think he's just that fast. Isn't that what a travisher is? Just a guy named Travis? <laughs> This is my Travis. Or is it a, it a girl named Travis? Yeah, Travis Her. Sure. <laughs> uh, Chad it's is asking how tall would the table be and how would the design change if you were going to do a standing desk? Well, for my design at least, I saw it as a desk, so it would be desk height. Off the top of my head, I don't know what that is, but you know, normal desk well, height. comfortable, right? Yeah. 29 inches um, or so. Okay, so if it was gonna be, if it was gonna be a standing desk or like a bar height, I think that, I think the legs would end up starting from beefier blocks, because you'd want to to maintain the flare of the legs along their entire length, which is now longer. So the beefier block would give you just more width to scoop away to maintain the flare. And I would think that as it gets taller, you'd also just, just for stability, want a slightly strong, bigger leg again because you're going to chop a lot of it away. Um, so I, I would guess that, that that would be the biggest difference is that, you know, for my design, I think I would just stretch the legs. I don't know that it would really change much. But in terms of construction, I'd probably start with a, with a beefier leg. But I'll be honest, I've never made anything like that, so I'm not entirely sure what the difference in construction from one to the other would be. Yeah, I don't think you would want to change the thickness of the top or add extra stretchers. I would as well. Yeah, I have to believe that the stretchers along the bottom and the, all the legs being attached to the solid top, I don't. forgetting the design for a moment, I don't think there's a really... Structural need to add more stretchers. So your your audio just went into the into the bunker again. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> I said that structurally, I don't think it needs additional stretchers if it's a standing desk. Even if the design would allow for it, I don't think they would be necessary. Yeah. Okay. One thing I do see in this is 
this design is a lot of open space, a lot of negative space, which you can either like or you can dislike. Um, I do like it without the, the spindles, if you want to call that, of the last design between the stretchers and the top. Um, I didn't really dislike them before either, but I, I, don't, I don't mind them not being here either. Um, I'm kind of thinking maybe fill it in with some kind of grid or lattice. A grid or a lattice, or maybe maybe something organic, because of the because of the curve on the outside. I could almost see doing like an Art Deco. You've ever have you ever seen the back of Andy Chidwick's Art Deco sculpted chair? It's like a Maloofish mm. style chair, but the back is non-symmetrical and has these kind of curves to it. It's he calls it his Art Nouveau. I think it's his Art Nouveau chair. Um, Something like that, this a uh, non-symmetrical just pattern of still more open space than solid space. I think might work in there to give it a little bit of give it a little bit more form and formalize that front face that's now almost all air, but not make it too heavy. He calls it his musical chair, I think. Hmm. I've got a link for it that I'll put into the chat room. It's so, at Chidwick School, right? Yeah, Chidwick School. So, so Brian had asked a while ago about what materials you'd use, and now that we're talking about grid, I'm kind of getting an idea of what I would do. Um, I think I'd like to see that the, the frame of the table in a light color wood, maybe like a, an eastern maple. And I'm thinking like a, get some steel um, mesh that's black. I don't know, maybe a quarter-inch grid or something, fit something fairly fine, and have that in between, in those spaces there. I think that would be nice to juxtapose the blondish wood with a, with a darker open metal. Mm -hmm. That could be really nice. But you would use steel in there, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or you could go with an aluminum color and maybe like an ebony or a, bl or a black walnut or wenge material for the desk for the frame. Hmm. If you're going to make the frame something dark, I would make it out of walnut. Walnut's just so easy to, to carve. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that ebony would be so nice to carve. <laughs> <laughs> Megan says it's a, it's a seat, it's a chair seat for a generously sized bottom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know whose bottom it's for, and I don't want to know. This over here that I'm looking at is the link that um, Matt posted to Andy's chair with the ace yeah, in the back. Yeah, there you go. Pretty interesting no, so he calls that the, On Lumberjocks, at least, he calls that his musical chair. The musical chair, yeah. See up the top there, you can go check that out. And lots of different colors in there, too. It's not just one wood. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm. I think one of the back slats is actually a uh, heartwood and sapwood on the sa all of the same piece, I believe, showing two different colors. Could, could well be. Whoa, excuse me. So we're trying to focus on Justin, but I don't think it's going to yeah, happen. I, th I think we'll, we'll have to get him on another week, maybe next week. Yeah. Um, From what I understand, though, that was quite a build-off. Uh, like I said, my, my fellow podcaster, Chris, was had dinner with Justin on, I think, Tuesday of the build. And he said the it was just crazy, not just the size of the benches the guys were making, but the shop they were making it in had all these crazy power tools. I don't um, – who had it on his blog? Jeff Miller, I think, had a blog post about it that showed the equipment. And I don't remember what it's called, but there was one machine that planed it and jointed it all in one step. Uh, they said it was just – mind-blowing, the mm. size and scope of the, of the tools in this guy's shop. They didn't do it all by hand? No, I was shocked, but no. <laughs> I don't know. Squaring a 16-foot long oak board by hand doesn't sound fun to me. Yeah. Um, maybe fun to watch somebody else for a few <laughs> minutes, but no. Uh, <laughs> It'd be fun to watch the condensed five-minute video of them shaping it by hand. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, on time lapse. Do we know how much the sixteen that sixteen foot bench weighed? Twelve hundred pounds, I do believe. That's not going to move. No. No. Um, if it does, it's really here, time to sharpen that plane blade. Yeah. Yeah. Six inches thick. Oh my God. Sixteen feet long, twenty-seven inches wide, and twelve hundred right. pounds so fully assembled. Think about the width first, the six inches thick for a minute. On the one hand, if you're going that long, 16 foot, I'm assuming you have to go thicker than you'd want to or else it's going to sag. But at six inches thick, doesn't that affect the ability to use like holdfasts and some of your some of your bench accessories because it's just too thick? It can, but they, they, uh, they recommend you drill reliefs then. Right, of, of, of the but bottom. Four inch holdfast hole with a two inch thicker hole at the bottom. Because the whole pass goes in, it has to go at an angle, and it won't hit, won't reach that angle. So you drill a relief hole on the bottom. And on a 16 foot bench, I wonder if you do another set of legs in the middle. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, you Megan. probably would. I don't think he did, but why not? Hmm. Hmm. Hey. Yeah, I'd put another set of legs right in the middle. Uh, Justin said it was they called a stratoplaner. Uh -huh. huge, huge beast of a machine. Hmm. Um, hold on a second. I'm still thinking about the, that uh, the tabletop and how to shape it, and it reminded me a bit of uh, this table by John Economaki. It's a coffee table, oh, that's and it's really got cool. this scoop. It's got a scoop at one end here, which actually, uh, it was the result of planar snipe. You got this giant planar snipe, and decided to instead of fight it, to to roll with it. So he mm -hmm. built the snipe into his work, and then carved these V V grooves, I guess you want to call them. Yeah, you could. So you could do that tabletop on a joiner, and you just keep lowering the infeed table. Yeah. So you get what you want. Um, of course, it wouldn't work for our design because you have something at the back, um, that curve there. But um, you you could do you could glue the top glue the back piece on separately. Maybe you have three boards making at the top. The first two make the yep. front two thirds, and the back one is the higher part. And just shape that one little that. The last bit. I think that'd be that'd be a pretty good way to go as well if you if you were gluing it up from a few boards. Justin says on the big bench there was no sag and the holdfast was custom made. Oh really? <laughs> uh, I believe the no sag part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oak, oak is hard as hell. Yeah. Uh oh, um, Bill Bill Griggs is already. Uh, doing the table in CAD, and he's going to see and see it. <laughs> oh, yeah? Go get it, Bill. Bill, That's can we commit to, to make, make uh, all the tables in, in CNC? Yeah, as a, as a participant, do I get a matching set of miniature tables? <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you make them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hmm. There, there still might be a way to rig up a joiner to do it if you did the top yeah. in multiple pieces. Yeah. This would be that I, little bit on the back of a fine woodworking in terms of the technique they developed to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could print, if you got a front, back, and top, and side views, if you could print it out on a cube and fold it up into a three-dimensional type object. It'd give you an idea of what you're looking at. It wouldn't be fully sculpted or anything, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you could. Maybe you have to go back and bug everybody who's done it and see if we can get uh, front, back, side, top. Maybe. We'll get some clay or I don't know. 3D printing, that's what we need. We need someone with a 3D printer. That uses wood. Yeah, I was, well, yeah, that's, yeah. Funny you mentioned that. Um, the post. I, I, you know, I think the hand route with just drilling a bunch of holes at the right depth isn't really yeah. going to be that bad. No, no, no I don't. 
Well, we're talking about like in the in the chat room, they're all talking about you know seats that have non-flat bottoms. This design, except for the sides, the bottom is flat. So again, route the bottom, and then use a series of of drilled holes to depth or a series of um, of routed. Um, let's call them. Uh, Rabbits. rabbits. Yeah, I guess they would be a rabbit. Thank you. I was thinking of the yeah, joint. Connect and then connect them. Yeah, I think I would agree. That's at the end of the day, that's probably the easiest and simplest way to do it. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. I don't think it's going to be that bad. And if you really wanted to, you could decide to, you know, make a, a, a card scraper to help you, or even um, a template. A, a template, you know, so that you know when you're done, or I don't think it would be that bad. I, I think I think you'd spend so much time trying to design a power tool way to do it <laughs> that if you just dove in and did the work the way they would have done it 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you'd probably just end up just fine. Hmm. I'll just yeah. use a router plane for the whole thing. Interesting question brought up in the chat room uh, by Chad Gorshing. Why, why use wood at all? Why not just 3D print the whole table? I know we're woodworkers, so we think wood, but... Yeah, I was going to say, because this is the wrong show. <laughs> yeah, but, I get to... Uh... So here's another example, though, Chris. I mean, you like to use different materials. Mm -hmm. Why not make a form and pour the top, out of, con and pour the con top out of concrete? That, that would be cool. And put I... it on wooden a wooden base and do mixed materials. I like I that like idea. That. Yeah. I don't know if all 3D printing is this way, but the little bit of 3D printing I've got on my hands on isn't terribly smooth to the touch. No, and if this it's is made not all that way. No. There's, ver there's, 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 there's various degrees of what I'll call resolution. Okay. So. Um, um, and the um, obviously the better the resolution, the more expensive the the printing material, and the more expensive is the printer. Mm -hmm. the longer it takes to print, but there's there's ways where it extrudes hot plastic. There's ways where it has a bed of powder that it shoots a laser on. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's just tons of different ways. So, and the interesting thing is that a lot of the patents are now going to expire, and so 3D printing has been kind of going well for the last few years, but it's really going to explode. So. Mm -hmm. Well then, we'll have to wait for that to happen maybe before we see some models. Yeah. I, I like that casting idea though. That that you know, that that's me. I'm I'm excited by that. It'd be cool. Don't don't limit yourselves, guys. We're not not just about wood here. <laughs> Would uh, uh, let's talk about the casting then for a second. Would that relatively wide top? Or long mm. top with the thin section in the middle. Yeah. If that's concrete now, is that going to be structurally okay? It de it depends uh, on the concrete, and it depends on if you um. You reinforce you it with a big thick yeah. rebar in it, but you can put a steel yeah. screen in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely need a screen in there to reinforce it. Um, the other idea I had was to sag a piece of glass or plastic into it. Yeah. Or or wood. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get crazy. You could you could M MDF MDF maybe. No, I hate MDF. No. I don't think you can say MDF like that anyhow. MDF is bad. Um, yeah. Um. There's a composite wood product. I can't remember. It's it's steamed and and compressed, and you can you can tie knots in it with your hands. I can't remember what it's called. Comp wood or something. Yeah, it's the um. I don't know. No, I know what it is. So it's it ships as it ships in a vacuum pack. It's wet. Yeah. You can yeah. do whatever you want with it and then cure it. Um. I wonder if that would. I I don't know. I don't know if you can get in wide pieces to do a desk, but. But you wouldn't need to because you could do multiple pieces and then edge glue them. Yeah. Well, that well you can you can do it without the, without that material. Mm-hmm. That's kind of. Defeats the purpose yeah, of it. Yeah, it's but. called Compwood. It's compwoodproducts.com. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll send you a pretty cool. Uh... Let 
link here. Yeah, I've, I've seen it before. I know people who have used that, that Compwood product. It um, could also be a metal tabletop or, I don't know, a bent, a bent lamination seems like a good way to go. I think metal would and, be nice. Like yeah. a zinc, make it almost like a zinc bar top. Yeah. What about the material they use to um to make uh, those like interior raised pan uh, the fake raised panel doors? Yeah, fiberglass. Basically stamped or uh, I guess you had fiberglass in too, but th these ones are just solid wood, like eighth inch mahogany skins. I think they're stamped basically. Okay. Matt, do you know what I'm talking about? The stamped concrete? Basically, no, no, like a stamped uh, interior wooden doors. Oh yeah, those are basically oh, oh. those are basically MDF. Are they MDF? Okay. They're, they're basically MDF. Yeah, they're the hollow core, okay. hollow yeah. core doors that are used on the interior that are they can do them in five panel. Well, look at the door over my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. That's one. Okay. They're okay. hollow. I, I, I thought that was real wood on real wood skins on the outside. No. Okay. No, there's a there's real wood around the edge, and then there's these panels that are basically pressed MDF pressed into a form skins. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a but there's a solid wood frame on the inside um, supporting the panels. And then there's is, does that have a, a cardboard honeycomb in there too? I don't know. I don't know. It might. But yeah, those doors are cheap, cheaply made. Mm -hmm. You could also get a corrugated cardboard honeycomb that's as thick as the outside part, and maybe sculpt away the inside, and I don't know, fill it with something, or or don't fill it, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work as a desk if you don't fill it. Yeah, uh, it depends if you're actually writing on it or if you're putting a computer on it and typing on it. You wouldn't have a bunch of food crumbs on your desk at the end of your meal either. Yeah. I suppose that is true. But as I did the sketch with with pencil and paper... You go from a spill lamp to a, a mesh top desk. Um, Call it a cummerbund. Yeah. <laughs> a crumb catcher desk. Your desk is always clean because all your crumbs are always... Like, a, like my keyboard is full of crumbs if I turn it over. Yeah. Yeah. Brian makes an interesting point. Um, if you're going to make it from concrete, you have to make a, a negative form. And at that mm -hmm. point, why not just make it from a solid piece of wood? And the, the difference that I see is that negative form would be a lot easier to make than the positive form because instead of cutting a recess, you're, cutting, you're, you're making a bump. Yep. So you yep. could have a, a piece of whatever your flat materials for the top of the desk and then just... Um, Tack on a piece of the bump in it. The the negative form is also easier because you don't have to worry about grain matching, so you can laminate any material you and want. You, really can, to build you can it make up. it out of a hundred different pieces if you wanted to. Yeah, and if yeah. you screw it up, you can always just fill it with <laughs> epoxy and reshape it, which you couldn't do in the final piece. Yeah. yeah I mean, you could you could make yeah. a rough form out of wood and then sculpt it with bondo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then if once you do that, though, then yeah. then you've essentially got a form for doing uh, a lamp, a wood lamination too. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of one of the coolest tabletops I've seen. Um, what they did is they took a they took a piece of wood with really heavy grain. I can't remember what it was, and they cast. They used it as a mold for a clear resin. So they got the wood print in the clear resin. Oh, cool. I'll try to find a picture of it for you guys. Yeah, get me a picture. And then I'm gonna pretty soon after that I'm gonna have to go I'm gonna have to grow. Yeah. Yes. It's after eleven right. here in the Yeah. Eleven for the, yeah. the right coast. Here it is. Wrong. <laughs> How do I find that picture for to this here? So I've got a picture here. I'm going to screen share it here for you guys. Um, most of these ideas I, I like, I put on my Pinterest board and just leave them there. 
So it's a translucent plastic. Oh, cool. That's really neat. It's kind of... It looks like a special effect. So they, d they just rely on the coarseness of the grain to um, cast that texture into the into the resin. I guess that would have been a, a really well-waxed piece of wood. I, I know when you cast, you have to make sure it doesn't stick to your form. So mm. uh, I'm not sure how they did that. Could you spray but, something on uh, it? Like, you know, almost like a maybe. shellac or a lacquer? Silicone, maybe? Yeah. Um, when I when I cast uh, Deconstructed, I, need to, I needed to put on, I think, five or six or seven coats of wax and buff it all every time. And I can't imagine that being fun on a coarse textured piece of wood. Wow. No, I think the time you were done with all that, it wouldn't be a coarse textured yeah, piece of yeah, wood. Yeah, yeah. All right. So how are we doing, Matt? Are we concave router sled? Any questions from the chat room? I haven't seen any in a bit. Let me check again. I I'm still. You're still I, trying to invite Justin. Well, I, I think I think <laughs> I told him that I think we're going to worry about that for next week. But yeah, we can invite him and say goodbye. Oh, Brian has a good idea. About, you could make a router sled. Uh, okay. That could follow the shape. Um, and if you used a box, what do they call it, a box bottom bit that's round, kind of round on the bottom? Core, mm -hmm. Core box. So if, and if your router sled had the curve and you used like mm. a Bosch Colt router, you could okay, follow sure. that curve. With, with a small base, yeah. yeah. Well, you could, okay. um, let me draw something real quick. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. And then you could also turn it at 90 degrees to get the back curve the same as well. Yeah, yeah, draw. and you could let yeah. you could let the diameter of your bit define those inside corners. That could make the corners yes, come out nice. But if you made a special yeah. router base, you'd be even better off. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I get yeah, it makes sense. So while while Matt does his drawing there, I guess I'll let you know that we will get Justin on the show next week to talk about this monster. Uh, what do you say, 1,200-pound bench, 16 feet long, as well as his bench at uh, a, a mere 400-plus pounds. And that was all part of a, a bench-building class that he was a part of with uh, Chris Atkins, I guess, right? Well, Chris only drove down there to have dinner with him. Chris had a real job. He oh, had okay. to work. Um, okay. But it was... Uh, part of the class. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think. I know Jeff Miller was down there. Chris Schwartz was down there. Um I'm blanking on the guy from Benchcrafted, but he was down there. I want to say he might have been the one to Jamil? organize. Jamil? Jamil, yes, thank you. Jamil was there. Yeah. Um, and I, 16, 18 guys built benches. Uh, Justin could probably do a much better job than I'm doing now of describing it. But I, um, yeah. It was a class cool. that they first announced many, many months ago. These is apparently all of, all of special French oak that came over from oh, a tree that, that Rubeau had kissed or something. Um, there's historical significance to the wood, apparently. Oh, okay, right. The guy had like a container well, load of the French oak. Right. Um, if you can't wait until next week, you can find it all in seven posts of pictures and text on Justin's blog. That's at halfblindwoodworker.blogspot.ca or .com, whatever. It's .ca for me. It's, okay. So it Matt's got a picture to share. So... Think about if you're. Um, <laughs> does that make it's sense? Like a at all? cat. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I just found it really Walk amusing that you had flat. to label the router you on. Want something that's flat to follow a curve, you usually do two points, so that yeah. this is always tangent to the curve, and then the router bit comes down past that, and you could. This is the curved form, so you put the curved form, and this thing will. This thing will go. So, that's my lame. That's my lame sketch. Sorry, but you could do it. You could do it if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, a, a router set is is a pretty good idea. So yeah, but but so far casting is my favorite idea. Uh, I I would do a con I might do a concrete a polished concrete top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It'd be kind of cold, and it would be, I don't know. don't know if that'd be, I don't know. I'll just think about that. I like the polished concrete top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be cool. Um, Justin put a put a picture of his bench up. I don't know if you saw that. It's yes. upside down on those massive it's horses he built. He got some massive sawhorses. Those are absolutely beautiful sawhorses. Huh. Build an extra yeah. bench top just yeah. to sit on the sawhorses. So. <laughs> All right, folks. I think it's time to wrap it up. We're sorry that we couldn't get Justin in today. I don't know why Google Next doesn't week. love Justin. Google discriminates against Justin. Doesn't like woodworkers that build benches out of French oak, I guess. <laughs> Um, oh, Brian, by the way, Brian said I'm right. So, thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. Chris Brian is also our next. To, uh, Chris sent a link in the chat room um, to Justin's blog so you can read more about the bench. Next week... That's blindwoodworker.blogspot.com. I thought it was blogspot.ca. Same difference. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we're going to try next week to get uh, Justin back in the Hangout. Um, I believe Brian Van Vreedy is up next. Chris, is that right? That's right, for the telephone game. Yeah. So he, he was, was, in, he was in the text chat today, so hopefully he followed along. Um, Diami, I think you should come back next week and show us your completed table that you've built. <laughs> you can have it all built by next week. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll let you know how the top worked awesome. out, because I think I'm going to go the, the router and power shaper method, so I'll tell you if that worked or not. Okay. Um, so that's it for and WinChat. Chat. For, what a score permission. Yeah. Guys, before we wrap up, do you mind if I just pl uh, plug something? Go ahead and plug something. Um, in a couple weeks, we've got Fine Woodworking Live coming up here on the East Coast, and they're doing a build-off among attendees. They're going to, on the Friday night of the event, they're going to just announce... This is what you have to build. Teams of four guys are going to hand them a couple of tools and make them build something right there in about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. and we're trying to organize a bunch of teams to kind of demonstrate that as online woodworkers, we can dominate a competition. So if people could go to either my blog at Penultimate Woodshop or the Modern Woodworkers Association, and you'll see recent posts about Fine Woodworking Live. And if you're going to be there, we'd really appreciate it if you join the MWA teams and uh, let's just show everybody that the online community knows how to build things. Cool. Yeah, that, that would, that's going to be so much fun. I wish I could be there. Yeah, I, 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 I share the feeling, because unfortunately I won't arrive until Saturday morning, so I'm really disappointed to, have, to miss the build-off. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but still, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna represent pretty well, and hopefully we'll, we'll do well in the competition. Either way, it's going to be a blast to just have these teams all at the same time building God knows what, with, I think yeah. they get a screw gun, a jigsaw, and some 2 by 4s It's really, really limited tool set. Wow. Wow. Hopefully it's not a sculpted piece. <laughs> Hopefully it is, dude. Yeah. A jigsaw? a jigsaw and a screwdriver. Yeah. A okay. jigsaw, you could do that. All right. We should have a contest, yeah. Who, who can build the best piece of furniture with the jigsaw? <laughs> you, you give, yeah, make a list, make a limited list of tools and a limited list of lumber and go. It's kind of like yeah. a 2 by 4 challenge. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, I had the great idea for a two by four <coughs> challenge. Make it, make a one by three. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, make a um, two by eight. <laughs> yeah. Of the same <laughs> length. Because you have to make it hollow. Okay. We have to um, we have to wrap it up. I know we're good. Yeah. We're going to have fun, but we're gone. <laughs> we're done. So sorry. So. Oh hey. boy. That was Wood Chat for uh, July 24th, 2013. We talked to Diami about his round as 007 in the Telephone Game Design Challenge and his fun with foam. Mm. Uh, next week, we'll try and get Justin mm. back in to the Hangout, uh, see if Google will like him next week. And uh, hopefully we'll have Brian Van Vreedy on that. Did you hear that, Brian? You have to join the Hangout next week to talk about his designs uh, for the Telephone Game Design Challenge. So that's it for me. I'm Matt Gravel from Uppercut Woodworks. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern over at uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom. Good night, Chris. Say good night to everybody. Okay, this is Chris Wong signing off. Before I sign off completely, I want to ask Diami a quick question. Yes, Chris. Foam board is a bad choice for prototyping. 
No. Um, I think it's like I I posted about this on Google Plus a couple days ago when I when I screwed this up. It's got a learning curve, and yeah. this was my first time doing it, so I think just like with real world, you got to practice with foam board a little bit. But the foam board is much cheaper and easier, so that's what to practice on. And Ooh, I happen to use 60 psi foam, which is very hard to come by. It's a very specialty product we use at work, and I just had a piece. Um, normal foam is 20 psi. I think the lower density would have made it easier to make this big recessed section in the middle. So I think I was making it more difficult than it needed to be by using the particular foam I used. So I would say go for it, get some foam, and try it. All right. You want to say good night, Diami? Good night to everyone, and thank you for having me on, guys. I've had fun. Great. We did too. Right on. Okay, everybody. That's it. We're waving goodbye. Good night. We'll see you next week. Good night.